distinguished participants, dear colleagues. Delighted to see you all again. Thank you very much uh, for your presence this morning. Uh, we have a particularly timely topic, uh, a, a discussion by our distinguished panel on the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, moving from process to substance. This is a topic, I think, that is at the top of the list for many of you here in terms of priorities. And so before giving the, the floor to each panelist, I would like to make a very brief presentation just to set the scene for this particular session. As you know, uh, migration, in contrast to when I started in 2008, very much an indifferent period, has become a key issue for uh, all, I, uh, all countries at global, regional, and bilateral level. We've got 244 million international migrants, more people living away from their country of origin than ever before. The number's probably much higher. And this figure does not include uh, persons who stay abroad for less than 12 months, so with a lot of temporary migration also. But as a percentage of the population, it's still about 3%. It has been that way since 1964. What is different is that people are moving from and to more places than ever before. Uh, a large number of these, unfortunately, around 65 million, a number that is actually increasing, are being driven from their homes by conflict, human rights abuses, climate change, 25 million refugees, and 40 million internally displaced persons, which is not even included in the Global Compact. Um, the vulnerable situations uh, uh, take place in the absence of any kind of effective protection mechanisms or international legal frameworks that would help them. There's also growing xenophobia and racism, discrimination against migrants in most parts of the world, uh, where it's seen basically as a problem rather than an opportunity. And we in the international community, and I'm talking about all of us here today, we have often been very disjointed in our response to migration. We focus too much on problems and too little on solutions, piecemeal, part-time, band-aid type approaches when something much more serious is needed. Um, and we need a, to develop a longer-term comprehensive policy. In the midst of these negative developments, however, there have been some important positive developments. In the Sustainable Development Agenda, for example, we committed ourselves, representing member states, to cooperate internationally to facilitate orderly, safe, regular, humane, responsible migration, the mobility of people, particularly Target 10.7. 10, target 10 we committed uh, to help migrants in relation to poverty eradication, health education, decent work, economic growth, etc. Now, we're fortunate because migrants and migration are included in the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and the new urban agenda growing out of the uh, Quito-Ecuador uh, meeting of the UN Habitat recently. The most prominent development has been the 19 September uh, New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. I was just saying the other night uh, what a, how fortunate we were to have had both uh, David Donahue and his Jordanian counterpart who did an amazing job uh, fashioning that declaration in a very short period of time. Uh, for the first time, heads of state came together in New York to consider at the global level, the situation of migrants and refugees. Uh, heads of state uh, made a lot of bold commitments in that declaration. They committed, for example, to protect the safety, dignity, and human rights of migrants in all categories. They undertook to support countries of origin, transit, and destination who are receiving large numbers of migrants and refugees. 
They agreed to try to integrate migrants, which has been one of the great difficulties, integrate them into humanitarian development planning. They undertook to try to combat xenophobia and racism, to develop through a state-led process non-binding principles and voluntary guidelines on how we should treat migrants. And they agreed to try to strengthen the global governance of migration, including by bringing IOM into the UN family, which was done, and through the development of a global compact, which is going to be our major uh, priority and our major challenge for the next two years. In fact, it's already less than two years. Now, Annex 2 of the Declaration sets out some of the very early aspects of a process that would develop a global compact at an international conference, intergovernmental conference in 2018. It is framed, uh, the compact is to be framed largely with the target 10.7 of the SDGs in mind. Um, it sets out a range of principles and commitments and understandings among us all about migration. The decision to develop such a comprehensive framework for international migration is a, is a, a tremendous task. And the promise is that migration would at last be guided by a set of common principles and approaches, which has escaped us all up to now. We can deal with the free flow of capital goods and services, but the people who make that happen, we have difficulty agreeing on what the guiding principle should be. Very ironic. We um, fully recognize and respect the sovereign rights of governments to determine who enters uh, and stays on and in their territories. Now, this, what I've always called a high road scenario, um, serves a number of major objectives, principally three. First of all, to facilitate safe, orderly, and regular migration, which is the migration that we want, to reduce or eliminate the incidence an impact of irregular or forced migration, which is the migration we don't want. And then thirdly, to try to respond to the mobility impact of natural, human-made, and climate change disasters, which is the migration that will occur whether we want it or not. So those would be our major objectives. Now, to do this, we have to put migrants and their rights and needs and capacities at the very heart of our efforts. We need to address migration's relationship to crucial areas, and I think it's the most cross-cutting issue I can think of. It touches all the policy domains, development, humanitarian, climate change, peace and security. The development of the Global Compact on Migration has to be member state-led if it's going to succeed. There's got to be that commitment there. The modalities uh, of the process and the convening of the Intergovernmental Conference in 2018 will have to be determined in the coming months, certainly not before January of 2017 um, in New York. So we have promised for our part that these consultations will be open and inclusive uh, and that our expertise and our perspectives will be available to all. Some of the core themes, and with this I'll try to close, to protect migrant rights, particularly those in vulnerable situations, to facilitate regular migration, expanding the legal pathways. There is a relationship between regular migration and irregular migration. The more legal pathways you have, the fewer people will be forced to take irregular pathways. We want to reduce the incidence and the impact of irregular migration and exploitation, including trafficking and smuggling, and facilitating returns and reintegration. 
We want to enhance migrants' contribution to socioeconomic development, ensure migrant integration and social inclusion, and address migration crises, including in relation to conflict, climate change, natural disasters, and finally, to foster good governance. Thank you very much for your patience. Let me now, if I may, turn to our first speaker. If I might ask Ms. Mary Robinson, uh, President Robinson, if you would take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a first for me. Um, this is the first time that I have addressed the IOM, and you're in your 107th session. So <laughs> thank you for High time. <laughs> thank you for that very warm welcome, and uh, thank you for setting the scene uh, so well uh, for us on this panel, which I'm delighted to participate in, because it's talking about uh, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration from process to substance. And the journey from process to substance is one that I must say I've been thinking about uh, over the past year. We're in a period of transition, transitioning from goal setting to implementation. But history won't remember the New York Declaration or the Paris Agreement or Agenda 2030 if we fail to follow through on those processes. The judgment of future generations will centre on the manner and the seriousness with which we undertake the implementation of those agreements and frameworks. The time for celebration has now passed and the time for work and action is upon us. Um, I was very pleased to hear um, the way in which you framed our um, uh, panel, but also the wider compact itself, um, uh, Bill. And I wanted to quote a speech that you made um, earlier um, at the Global For Forum, an event organised by the Global Forum on Migration and Development, in which you uh, indicated that you saw three C's as being central um, to the efforts to develop the Global Compact, and really you've touched on that again today, and that is comprehensiveness, coherence, and cooperative. Um, I think the, the approach is a good one, and I'd like today to focus on the element of coherence um, and to explore it in a little more depth. Um, on the 1st of October, here in Geneva, in fact, I chaired a panel on human rights, migration and displacement related to the adverse impacts of climate change. It was an expert meeting organised by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, my former office that I'm very close to. Um, the panel and subsequent discussion session brought together actors from a wide array of different organisations currently working on climate displacement, including diverse representatives from international organisations, including the IOM, from civil society, as well as non-UN multilateral processes and party delegates to the UNFCCC. The most striking refrain I heard on that day was the need to eliminate silos not just in international processes and organisations, but within civil society and within national governments. Silos, of course, aren't something new, but they are an increasing risk to the manner in which we undertake our work. It's easy to see the world lurching from crisis to crisis. We see major movements of people across the globe, driven by war, economic disparity, and the ravages of a changing climate exacerbating already overtaxed resources. At the same time, there appears to be a reduction in the faith in multilateralism, increasing rifts in global communities and distrust in processes that have been, pro that have been pro proven, if flawed, arbiters of peace and security. But I believe that there is reason for hope. We already have the tools for coherence, so it's up to countries to marshal these. And I must say IOM has led the way in this with its long history of close collaboration with the UN family and through taking the significant step this year of joining that UN community. I was also very pleased to endorse the atlas, um, this very significant um, atlas um, for um, uh, environmental uh, migration, um, and I'm very pleased today to get a copy of it, um, which it's been, I know, presented uh, at this session of the uh, Council, and it brings to again, uh, together many elements of coherence that I will be noting today. And these are cl the clear and identifiable links between Agenda 2030, the UNFCCC process, and the Global Compact on Migration, and how they're all underpinned by human rights. Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals are clear that the goals 
and their means of implementation are universal, indivisible and interlinked. Sustainable Development Goal 10.7, as you recall, is, and I quote, to facilitate orderly, safe, regular and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through the implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. The Global Compact for Migration will clearly play a central role in the implementation of that part of Goal uh, 10. As such, it behoves all countries involved to ensure that this implementation addresses not only the immediate needs of migrants and the impacts and drivers of migration of the present, but that it also builds solutions and creates pathways for the migration that will be experienced by future generations. We know that climate change will be a significant driver of migration in the years to come. It is already a driver. It is already displacing people both internally and across borders, but it will be much more significant in the future. A few months ago, in my capacity as one of the Secretary General's special um, envoys on El Nino and climate, um, I was in Honduras. While there, I travelled about three hours from the capital to a rural community and listened to women from nearby villages brought together by a very good Honduran women's group. And one woman told me about the struggles she faced. We don't have any water, she told me. How can you live without water? And the answer is simple, you can't. She can't. We must find a way to ensure that she has access to water. We have two responsibilities in this regard. The first is to act on climate change to reduce the impact it's having on people like her and their access to the fundamental building blocks of life and livelihoods. But we also have to ensure that there are pathways available for her to leave and secure a new life if the water doesn't return. This is a response of last resort, but one that must be provided for and guided with a full respect for her human rights. From her perspective, these are obvious obligations we hold, but looking at the international landscape, the way forward can feel far more muddied. The basic rights of those displaced by climate change must be recognised and protected, and this will be a central test of the Global Compact, and whether it's a compact for the future or one trapped in the news cycles of today. The Compact must recognise that at its core, climate displacement is an issue of justice and that migrants moving as a result of the impacts of climate change or of related issues exacerbated by climate will in large part represent the most vulnerable in our society and the least responsible for the causes of climate change. I really can't stress this enough. People displaced by climate change will represent the furthest behind that we have committed to reaching first under Agenda 2030. Each person displaced in this way will represent a failure by the global community to take the action required to limit climate change and take the adaptive steps required. Without effective planning, each displaced person will experience at a minimum a temporary denial of their basic rights guaranteed under the core human rights treaties. To ensure cohesion, the Global Compact for Migration must recognise that climate change and human rights are cross-cutting issues that will be intrinsic in ensuring a fair and just approach to migration in the face of an increasing threat. And I was very pleased to hear Ambassador Swing emphasise this. So these are the moral imperatives that have been set before us and the tools we can use to incorporate them into the public discourse and into policy solutions. As this panel will be um, about moving from process to substance, I wanted to include some substantive proposals here. Firstly, the compact should recognise the intrinsic link between climate change and migration. Including climate change as a key driver of mi migration now and in the future, and noting that the most effective way to limit its impacts is to achieve the 1.5 degree goal set out in the Paris Agreement, which came into force last month. That would emphasise a coherence of approach. Secondly, noting that all migrants are covered by human rights and that people displaced by climate change may need differing rights protections from other migrants. For example, with whole communities and in some cases potentially countries threatened with displacement and the need to migrate, we must consider the need to protect their cultural heritage and self-determination. This is central to allowing for migration with dignity. And we have examples of countries like Kiribati, whose president has prepared by buying land in Fiji for a potential migration with dignity. And he's talking about a whole people. 
It's by ensuring the voices of the margin, that the voices of the marginalised are heard that we can best understand their needs and the responses we must undertake to assist them. Finally, the compact must note and engage its place within Agenda 2030. And in so doing, recognise that responsible and orderly migration is a central component to reducing inequalities and achieving sustainable development, and that it is indivisible from the wider goals, including combating climate change. Ensuring these elements are included will build a global compact that's compatible with the principles of climate justice and that delivers a fairer world for current and future generations. So in conclusion, let me return briefly to the panel that I cha chaired here in Geneva on climate displacement. I noted previously that siloing was an issue that concerned a number of the experts who were present. But perhaps the recommendation that resonated most strongly with me was to establish mechanisms for impacted people to participate in relevant decision making. This is a key element to any international process to ensure success and delivery of results that are people centred. We already see the impacts of dictating policy without listening around the world. We see it in climate action doesn't, that doesn't respect the property rights of indigenous people, driving them from their land. Um, some of the worst violations of human rights at the moment are by those who are providing clean energy the wrong way, with very big projects that don't respect local rights by um, trampling on l poor land rights and water rights of people. And we see it also in social policies that are failing marginalised and vulnerable groups around the world. So we've started a process towards a global compact for migration. If we want to ensure that the substance of the compact respects human rights, delivers action that is responsible to the needs of the most vulnerable and reaches the furthest behind first, then we need to have them in the room. Not protesting outside, not watching as their crops wilt while we speak, but present and engaged, telling us their stories and their needs and ensuring that they, not us, not an international bureaucracy and not a self-serving nationalist or populist agenda are at the centre of the response to migration today and in the future. It was the great suffering of the Second World War that actually gave birth to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the Refugee Convention in 1951 and the IOM. At that time, the world came together in the face of terrible degradations to the human spirit and created something that showed we could do better. It's now our turn in difficult circumstances, as we all acknowledge, to undertake a similar journey, to develop new pathways for the thousands, indeed millions of people on the move now and in the future, fleeing war, poverty and environmental degradation. The full weight of history is on our shoulders and the gaze of the future is on our actions. So I urge us all to remember that we're engaged in the protection of the core principle of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that, and I quote, the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in our world. And so we must not fail. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, President Robinson very much for uh, this, uh, in many ways, a call to action. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion that we're going to be able to spend the next uh, 15 months uh, consulting before we get down to negotiations. I have a feeling that the consultation process will very, very quickly lead to negotiations on some of these knotty issues. And I liked your emphasis on implementation, uh, in other words, moving from commitment to concrete action doing it in a coherent fashion because we have the SDGs. We have a lot of framework already for these discussions. So I don't think that, uh, I don't think it'd be that difficult to identify what the key elements actually are. And you've singled out one of these, climate change as a driver and the importance that climate change be included as an integral element in our discussions and in our negotiations and how we ultimately conclude. And then I think in a way, we've introduced two new concepts this morning. One is the concept uh, of community displacement and state displacement. I mean, we had the president of Kiribati, uh, President Tong, with us last year as our keynote speaker. And he made it very clear that they expect to lose many, if not all, of the 39 atolls that constitute Kiribati. And also the other concept that a new concept of statelessness. I hope the 61 convention will cover it. But when the state doesn't disavow you, you lose the state physically. So we've got, there's a lot at stake here. And I'm sure that climate change 
is going to be a very important part of our discussions as we move ahead toward the Global Compact. So let me, with that, uh, let me turn to our next speaker. Let me switch my list here. I've forgotten the segment. <laughs> our next speaker is um, Ambassador Radio. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to, to share this, this panel with this, uh, a group of high-level experts, and uh, also especially with a well-known and respected personality, Madame uh, Mary Robinson. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Ambassador, since we um, have this very uh, outstanding and professional uh, service of interpretation. I will I will sw switch into Spanish if you, if you don't you don't mind. Uh, <coughs> first, I Spanish. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, no eh, quisiera eh, dejar pasar la oportunidad de reiterar, to eh, Embajador Swing. Ambassador el reconocimiento de, de mi país, el reconocimiento de México, country, por eh, su liderazgo y la, la persistencia, diría yo, en la tarea de abordar el, este fenómeno tan complicado como la migración de una manera tan decidida en todos los niveles. Hace, ustedes recordarán que hace apenas un año nos preguntábamos en este consejo cómo continuaríamos el diálogo para mejorar el tratamiento y la atención al, al, a la migración. Hoy el camino es, eh, es más claro y desde luego debemos poner ahora todo, nuestra, todo lo que está a nuestro alcance para mejorar el tratamiento del tema. Eh, eh, por ello, agradezco nuevamente la, so, la invitación, eh, embajador, like para conversar en este consejo sobre la responsabilidad de la comunidad internacional para alcanzar el Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular, como fue acordado en la Declaración de Nueva York. Eh, la propia cumbre, como todos the sabemos, itself, eh, de grandes movimientos de refugiados y migrantes constituyó un parte aguas, diría yo, eh, al reconocer la imperante necesidad de lograr consensos y acuerdos para enfrentar de manera eficiente e integral el fenómeno de la movilidad eh, humana. Y desde luego lo anterior no es gratuito, es el reflejo del contexto actual en donde las personas en movimiento constituyen una realidad inherente a nuestra condición humana, exacerbado desde luego por los conflictos y crisis que prevalecen. Eh, permítame desde luego eh, reafirmar, como te, ustedes saben, eh, que la migración representa para México un gran compromiso ante todo y una alta prioridad. Con este espíritu nos sentimos muy honrados eh, de que uno de los cofacilitadores sea eh, un embajador de México, desde luego a título personal, pero un embajador de México en Nueva York junto con el distinguido representante permanente de Suiza. Durante, como mencionó eh, el embajador eh, Swing, eh, durante las consultas de la semana pasada, el día 1 y 2 de diciembre, nos pareció que fue muy clara la voluntad de los facilitadores para ejercer su responsabilidad, para llevar adelante su, su tarea de una manera inclusiva, transparente y abierta con las aportaciones de todos. Alcanzamos un buen resultado, un resultado fructífero, como un primer paso. Eh, y desde luego, eh, esta inclusión de todos es lo que nos permitirá alcanzar al final del camino una, un resultado realista y satisfactorio en este, en este importante proceso. Como mencionó también el embajador Sun, eh, y lo, 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 eh, lo compartieron los, facilita los cofacilitadores, eh, el día 9 de diciembre, próximo ya, a unos a tres días, presentarán eh, la, lo que le llamarán la resolución cero what is eh, going to be called resolution zero proceso. on the modalities y for the process. Saben, el, el día 31 de And on the 31st de, of January año, next year, the General Assembly eh, 
para aprobación we'll esta resolución con las modalidades de nuestro proceso. Déjenme eh, hacer una breve referencia like a las perspectivas de México en torno al Pacto Mundial, con la idea de, de contribuir un poco a la, a la, so a la substancia. Eh, primero, eh, México desde luego First favorece all, un proceso de negociación pragmático basado en un enfoque humano y que guardando la naturaleza intergubernamental escuche las voces de otros actores relevantes para la sociedad, como la sociedad civil, el sector privado, la academia y desde luego los propios migrantes. Eh, segundo, el, el carácter multisectorial de, del fenómeno migratorio requiere del esfuerzo de todos, desde luego. En este sentido, Aspiramos, aspiramos a que el Pacto Mundial sea el resultado de una acción congruente y coordinada del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, donde la OIM y la UNDESA tienen un papel relevante con base en sus ventajas comparativas y mandatos, tomando como referencia desde luego la declaración de Nueva York. Tercero, eh, Ginebra en este proceso, todos lo sabemos y está claramente establecido en la declaración de Nueva York. Ginebra cuenta con la experiencia técnica, no solo en el, en el ámbito migratorio, como es muy claro hoy aquí, sino en otras áreas como derechos humanos, trabajo, salud, refugiados, asuntos por nombrar algunos. Eh, Nueva York, desde luego, constituye la plataforma política del sistema multilateral. Por lo tanto, las fortalezas de ambas sedes son trascendentales y debemos asegurar que el Pacto Mundial sea un logro verdaderamente universal, integral y con resultados concretos. Cuarto, los mecanismos existentes a nivel global, como también lo mencionó el embajador Swing, a nivel global y regional, son resultado del interés, compromiso y esfuerzos de nosotros, de la comunidad internacional, por abordar la complejidad de la migración directa o indirectamente. Por eso nos sumamos al, al llamado de, no, y la conocida frase de evitar reinventar la rueda e incorporar, e incorporar los progresos de los mecanismos que ya fueron mencionados, la Agenda 2030, Sendai, el Foro Mundial de Migración y Desarrollo que en unos días global eh, tendrá lugar framework on eh, en Bangladesh migration development, uh, y, y, which y is otros. Going to be eh, quinto, eh, México considera que eh, si bien el carácter del Pacto Mundial no tiene precedentes, es un, es un diríamos, un, un evento, una, un, un sin precedentes, sin embargo, no partimos de cero. Existen We lecciones aprendidas que pueden nutrir which can a nivel de formato y procedimiento la dirección del resultado que queremos obtener como comunidad internacional. México es de la opinión de que debemos contar con un resultado práctico, medible y flexible, fundamentado en los compromisos de Estados y otros actores para impulsar acciones concretas. La, pensamos que la combinación de las opciones que los cofacilitadores incluyeron en el documento de elementos que todos, que todos eh, conocemos eh, es una buena base para trabajar eh, con una combinación adecuada de la de una declaración política que dé legitimidad al pacto, compromisos de acción concretos, medios de implementación que permitan su seguimiento y un mecanismo de monitoreo. Eh, yo, director general, distinguidos eh, expertos, eh, México finalmente Mexico aspira a que en el pacto incorpore la siguiente o al menos las siguientes siete áreas temáticas que mencionaré muy brevemente areas, para concluir. Uno, la perspectiva de derechos humanos, desde luego. Dos, una visión de responsabilidad compartida en países de origen, tránsito, destino y retorno. Cuarto, un enfoque de inclusión social para hacer frente a la intolerancia, los prejuicios y el racismo. Uno más, el reconocimiento de las contribuciones de los migrantes al desarrollo económico y social de las comunidades. Sexto, una mayor cooperación internacional para fortalecer las capacidades de los estados en la atención integral de la migración. Y finalmente, séptimo, considerar, como ya se mencionó aquí, 
el cambio climático y los desastres como causas de la migración. Agradezco nuevamente esta oportunidad y estamos seguros de que nosotros, la comunidad internacional, sabremos estar a la altura de las circunstancias, aprovechar el momento y producir un resultado concreto, sustantivo y eficaz, como dijo muy bien Madame Robinson, estos importantes logros de la comunidad internacional que se mencionaron buena parte de 2015 y 2016, como la agenda y otros logros, no serán recordados a menos que seamos capaces de llevarlos a la práctica de manera expedita, práctica y positiva. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Heredia. It's a delight to have you with us, and appreciate very much your your, your uh, important contribution here this morning. I think reminding us again that uh, human mobility is uh, uh, integral to humanity, and we've been on the move since uh, time immemorial, and will continue to be. I think it's entirely appropriate that Mexico was selected as one of the uh, co-facilitators. Uh, it is, after all, the largest and most active migration corridor in the world. It's less active now than it has been in the past, but it still remains the top corridor. Very, very appropriate. Um, I think that also, uh, uh, as you indicate, uh, we've already got um, a resolution zero on the modalities process that will be presented. You've got the 31 January a deadline for the uh, consideration by the General Assembly, so you've given us some insights into the calendar ahead. Um, it seems to me that uh, the co-facilitators document of elements that we have gives us already a pretty good indication uh, of, the, of the road ahead. I like your emphasis on being pragmatic, uh, getting results. Uh, I like the uh, whole idea uh, thank you for reminding everyone that it is the, the expertise in this, on this issue is primarily in Geneva at this point in terms of agencies, and I hope that that will ensure the uh, inclusion of uh, Geneva uh, as an important part of the process. Um, and as you remind us, we're starting from a fairly solid platform with all of the mechanisms we have, all the agreements we have. Uh, and the, um, the whole number of elements you outlined at the end in terms of human rights, shared responsibility, capacity building, climate change, uh, social inclusion, the integration process, and then keeping the focus on the contributions that migrants make, which are often not given enough, enough publicity. But thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I now want to turn to our third speaker on my left here, our good friend uh, Gregory Maniatis, the senior advisor to our very good friend, um, Mr. Peter Sutherland, who's been at this podium a number of times at IOM uh, councils in the past. But so, uh, Gregory, you have the floor. Here. Um, thank you uh, very much, Ambassador Swing. I'm uh, delighted to be here and on this panel and with such a distinguished um, group. Um, I truly wish Peter uh, could have been here with us today, uh, but he fell ill in uh, September and is not yet uh, able to engage in work. I can think of no moment, though, that would have meant more to him than this one, addressing the first IOM Council after the IOM's entry into the United Nations system. When Peter met Kofi Annan in uh, the winter of 2006, shortly after he was appointed special uh, representative, he made an impassioned case for the IOM to enter the United Nations. He then spent 11 years continuing to make that case at every opportunity uh, with the fierce uh, determination uh, and charm uh, that we all know so well. So as of September, the IOM is a related UN organization, uh, which means a crucial step has, has been taken. But now the IOM must establish itself as the leader on migration at the multilateral level, beginning with the role it will play in supporting the Global Compact on Migration. 
This is not and should not be seen as a matter of pride or turf. It's not a comment on other agencies that have absolutely critical and indispensable, ro indispensable roles to plan migration, like DESA, OHCHR, the ILO, UNDP, the World Bank, UN Women, UNICEF, and the incoming chair of the GMG, uh, UNU. Instead, it speaks to the vital need for the UN and the broader multilateral system to benefit from determined leadership on migration. For there to be a forceful, deeply well-informed voice that pulls the UN system together and that pulls the international debate on migration forward and that can translate policy decisions quickly and well into actions on the ground. Think of this role, if you will, as being first among equals. Today, this leadership is needed more than ever before, not only because the scale of international migration has grown, but because migration has become a fiercely contested and divisive political issue. What started in Syria several years ago as a manageable humanitarian crisis has become an existential crisis for the European Union and is now a generational threat to the post-World War II international order. In this respect, today is going to be harder than yesterday and tomorrow is going to be harder than today. Anti-migrant populism is the cheap fuel that's propelling the rise of authoritarianism. The UN and the IOM will come under attack in the coming months and years because we're at the beginning, not the end, of a wave of anti-globalization, anti-universalist populism. For many people around the world, unfortunately, migrants are the face of globalization, and the UN is the face of universalism. Our issues, in other words, are in the crosshairs. So the response of this organization and of the multilateral system must be to show that international cooperation is indispensable in meeting the needs of member states, in protecting the rights of migrants, and promoting the well-being of the communities that receive them and the communities that they leave behind. Last year, Peter and his team embarked on the drafting of a report that we hope can serve as a roadmap for such action. It will be released next month in New York, but today I want to share with you an overview of the recommendations that will be featured in the report. We believe that these recommendations are highly relevant to the upcoming global compact consultations and negotiations. The report comes after 11 years of Peter's service as SRSG. Its intention is to chart concrete avenues for progress for states and the UN system in close cooperation with other stakeholders. A lot of progress has been made in the, la the last 11 years in terms of confidence building among states through processes such as the GFMD, norm development, and the inclusion of migration in the 2030 agenda. In the last two years in particular, the Mediterranean crisis has catapulted migration and refugees to the top of the international and many national political agendas. Unfortunately, the progress at the international level has occurred in parallel with serious backsliding on states' commitment to international norms, including the refugee, protection of refugees, and a surge in unilateralism that has fanned mistrust. Many governments face enormous political pressure to curb migration and are intensely focused on short-term measures, while many publics have lost confidence that their leaders are up to the task. The answer cannot be more of the same, neither from states nor from the UN. On the 19th of September, world leaders convened at the UN and committed themselves to negotiate by 2018, as we've heard, two compacts, one on migration and one on refugees. In the migration field, where a global framework has been lacking to date, this presents a real opportunity to lay ground rules for international cooperation. 
We cannot afford to spend the next two years simply renegotiating existing commitments or on high-flying but untethered rhetoric. So what would an ambitious global compact look like? The compact should identify common goals for migration management and establish a global framework, including shared principles and minimum standards to guide future interregional, regional, and bilateral migration agreements in key areas. In order to meet the interests of all parties, it would likely need to combine substantive opportunities for legal movement with cooperation on immigration enforcement and return and financial support for development and governance capacities in, origins con in origin countries. The report identifies three essential relationships that shape migration processes. These include the obligations and responsibilities of states vis-a-vis -vis migrants, states vis-a-vis -vis other states, and states vis-a-vis -vis other stakeholders. And the report makes recommendations pertaining to five policy priorities improving protection for migrants, including in the context of crisis movement, creating opportunities for labor mobility, enhancing orderliness through return and reintegration, promoting inclusion and development, and strengthening governing capacities. So let me give you a few insights into what the report will say about each of these. In terms of protection and crisis movements, we need to define who needs what kinds of protections, developing guiding principles in this respect, with special attention to children. We need to strengthen capacities to assist migrants through networks of assistance centers and consular cooperation. And we need to establish legislative frameworks for and agreements around legal pathways so people can move in a safe and orderly way. In terms of opportunities for labor and skills mobility, we need to reduce recruitment costs for migrant workers and improve access to finance advance recruitment regulations using incentives, and promote consolidation in the recruitment industry. We need to facilitate conclusion of migration agreements by developing model contracts and agreements, providing technical support, and a platform for negotiating regional and bilateral agreements. And we need to strengthen knowledge exchange and partnerships around skills development, certification, and recognition. With respect to return and reintegration, we need to start a dialogue to develop principles governing international cooperation on return and reintegration. With respect to inclusion and development, we need to protect the fundamental rights and access to basic social services for all migrants, regardless of migration status. We need to ensure that earned social benefits are portable, in particular health care. We need to improve remittance markets and financial inclusion to fight poverty. And we need to provide universal uh, identity for uh, people on the move and for all people. The report focuses also on what the international system, what the UN system should be doing in terms of strengthening governance capacities. And it highlights five areas where a strengthened UN system must perform better. The first is in anticipating and reacting quickly to movements in crisis. The second is speaking with one voice to deliver political messages. Third, to support and monitor the implementation of the SDG commitments. Fourth, to support soft law development and the formulation of common standards. And finally, to work towards the conclusion of new issue-specific treaties. Th there are more detailed uh, recommendations in terms of how to do this in the report. Uh, and we also emphasize a series of other governance measures that uh, don't involve only the UN, for instance, uh, financial and technical support to enable countries to deliver on their commitments. Um, that is a big part of the report, the financing of all of this. Support for cities and, other, and their networks in order to be able to help integrate migrants and refugees. And coherence and transparency at the national level. Governments need to adopt a whole-of-government approach going forward, including ministries uh, of all kinds and levels of government, and bringing civil society and private sector partners along if they're to succeed. Progress must not wait for universal agreement. Small coalitions of states and other stakeholders can take things forward now and attract others and move the consensus along. 
In fact, many of the recommendations of the Sutherland Report could be pursued now and be developed into well-considered, broadly consulted draft operational agreements by the time we reach 2018. Working in this spirit of solving problems now is the best, uh, best response to the assault on universal ideals and on multilateralism that is taking place today. We find ourselves at one of those decisive crossroads in history when we as individuals cannot assume that others, governments, international institutions, political leaders, will quell the danger. Each of us now bears the responsibility to act. The Sutherland Report offers us a roadmap for such action. Thank you. So thank you very much for um, signaling uh, the key role that Peter Sutherland has played over these many years since he was first named SRSG 11 years ago, uh, nearly, I guess it is. Uh, he has been the real champion of IOM's entry into the UN. He, along with, uh, I was almost a partner in this activity, uh, Antonio Guterres, when he was high commissioner here. Uh, and I think your two voices have been very eloquent and have brought us to this, this point very largely. So please send the gratitude of all 166 member states of IOM to Mr. Sutherland uh, with our very best wishes for, for his uh, uh, full and uh, quick recovery. Um, I think that uh, you've uh, described us as being first among equals is perhaps a good way to put it. We, uh, we certainly recognize we have built IOM during my time uh, on partnership. We continue, we plan to continue that. It's extremely important that we do this together. There are many other partners in, in migration. You've called attention to the very, to use Peter's word, the very toxic environment in which we will now have to pursue this global compact. It will be a major challenge just because the atmosphere is so negative right now. Um, I want to thank you for giving us some initial insights into the SRSG's uh, report forthcoming, I believe you said, in January. Uh, we've been eagerly awaiting that for some time, and I can tell from the flavor of what you've given us here that it's going to be extremely helpful to us. It will be, I think, extremely timely relative to the uh, Global Compact on Migration and will help us with a lot of the, the initial consultations and negotiations, identifying the three relationships that states have, uh, the whole overview you gave us, looking upon uh, migration as an opportunity, uh, the five recommendations, the whole uh, aspect of the five areas of UN reform and so on, all of which I think will help us in, in our thinking. So thank you, thank you very, very much for that. And we look forward to receiving the full report in January. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the person who's come the longest distance has also had to wait the longest. And I apologize, uh, Professor. We're delighted to have you here, Professor Iguchi, uh, from uh, your, your post in Japan. And you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador Swing. Uh, I firstly, I would like to express my gratitude that uh, Ambassador Swing was very active in visiting Asia and also especially Japan to discuss uh, this uh, global uh, situation and also the necessity for make more changes in in Asia in Asian but Asia, and and it was very nice that uh, I can participate in this dis discussion today. And uh, at the same time, when you look at uh, the slide, uh, I'm not only uh, a researcher, but also uh, involved in uh, local initiatives, and also at the national level, regulatory reform, and then I'm also involved in the, this kind of multilateral consultation, and that is naturally very complicated. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I like to draw some practical solutions that is very, naturally very important. And the secondary, but uh, we need to 
uh, 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 explore uh, the mechanism how to achieve that and how to create that and that is that should be also based upon and research and also evidences and otherwise it, uh, it can not be the feasible and thirdly I like to stress stress that, that the gap between global level and local level national level that is still very great and therefore we need to uh, discuss about the, about the, the about uh, the necessity for more global consciousness the more global consciousness that is not a very important key in achieving this kind of initiatives that is my my very intention yes and and coming to the next slide sorry uh, this is just uh, because of time constraint this is just essentials and uh, uh, the first point I like to tell you about the Asian situation because the uh, recently the discussion on uh, migration crisis uh, or a refugee crisis is especially uh, uh, on the basis of European one very very strong impression we had but at the same time it is also important to tell you that uh, Asia has long been faced with mixed migration it was so much complicated that the mixed migration means regular and irregular migration and uh, and many governments in Asia has been par 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 paralyzed by this kind of very complex of the complexity of the situation and and some uh, governments are, are very very much fearful about accepting refugees uh, and uh, when they accept refugees uh, the uh, diplomatic or international relations with the country of, of the origin might be damaged or maybe worsened that is naturally always a fear for us and uh, these countries have naturally then uh, as a result uh, nation centric migration policies and yeah when we when when in europe and north america nationalism is now gaining ground and this is stronger but in asia from the beginning our mentality is na nation centric and that is naturally a very important point and uh, therefore we are for example uh, acceptance of refugees number has been very low in several countries and also at the same time those countries who have already ratified ratified the Geneva Convention and also New York protocols they, they, they are num their number is very very small Natural, naturally Japan Korea and China have already ratified and we are accept our now receiving more and more uh, asylum seekers but uh, we cannot acknowledge so not so many refugees and therefore it is much more important to create more create more legal channels for reg for regular migrants that is not a very important point therefore European way of thinking how to how to lessen the burden of refugee recognition systems and uh, also all the integration policies that it also can also the case in in Asia that we need to create more uh, regular regular channels otherwise we cannot cope with this them and in from the situation of Asia those who are uh, recognize uh, acknowledge refugees are not only the people 
who are in danger, who are uh, suffered from, from poverty. And there are so many people in danger and who are suffer from poverty. We cannot make a clear distinction or demarcation between the two. That is a reason, therefore, it is, it is also recommended to make a several kind of practical uh, way of, of, of getting, uh, achieving these things. So now I'm, I'm going to, the list of practical solutions, I have already formulated 11 ones. <laughs> and, <laughs> but because of the time constraints, I can't make it, but, uh, and uh, based upon uh, um, several kinds of empirical findings, not only theoretical, but also other things. Uh, we have already tackled to find several kinds of migration chains and also the role of diasporas and also the relationship between internal and international migration. And, the, and also at the same time, we try to create, uh, find, to, uh, find the evidence of a migration trade link and migration investment link so that we can uh, create more channels for regular migration. And then and I'm, I'm going to the last part of, of my presentation. <laughs> the first three, uh, without huge burden on refugee recognition systems, alternative le channels should be created as ma as many as possible. First three, not the re refugee resettlement according to the national plans and uh, through UNHCR. That is a very important way of accepting these people through legal way to in Asian countries. And at the same time, it is also recommendable to create more uh, uh, acceptance of st refugee students and also trainees as refugees and also as a, as a, as a types of uh, people who will be coming as a family reunification. And, and I, I, I am, because of time constraint, I like to tell you uh, uh, some, some additional things that uh, we have bilateral labor agreements or arrangements, but uh, based upon our researches, these, there are so many, so different, different achievements, and some of them are not well controlled, and that it is not, it, it is not possible for the governments to to monitor them. But it is also important to say that these. Uh, these arrangements should have to be reconsidered and strengthened, and also the sanction should not be based not only be based upon labor laws, but also penal code. That is especially on on trafficking, penal code uh, or, or on trafficking. These things. So, and uh, there are other list of a list of uh, practical solutions. Uh, which I have pro uh, I have pro pro proposed to you. This should be. I hope uh, IOM Secretary will add. We'll be making more discussion about my present um, about these. And 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 at the end, sorry because of time constraints. <laughs> the last one. Uh, creating more global consciousness is uh, also essential in uh, successfully achieving SDG. That is my, my strong point because uh, uh, the consciousness are so different at the multilateral level and national level and local level. And therefore, we, I like to stress three points. One is to uh, spread more global consciousness on suffering of migrants. Another one is courage to live for the future. And also, important thing is compassion on diversity. These things are also important when we uh, 
when we create a more collaboration and solidarity to achieve SDG uh, based upon uh, more global consciousness. That is the last point which I like to say. So at the end, uh, in, in the concluding remarks, uh, I would like to add to you that uh, we would like to make it, try to strengthen solidarity with international organizations for migration and also to create more networking in, within Asia to collaborate with IOM. Thank you very much indeed. I'm grateful to you, Professor Iguchi, for coming this long way to be with us and for delivering us a very, very interesting and insightful presentation. A lot of practical solutions and recommendations and ideas which uh, we will in IOM certainly digest and see which ones we can ourselves adapt and put into practice here. Thank you for giving us insights into the Asian context. Uh, uh, mixed flows uh, sounds very familiar to us. And you're getting very much at the heart of the problem when you recognize through mixed flows that there are many, many uh, people out there on the move who don't qualify for refugee protection, but who need protection of some sort, practical protection, and who need assistance. Um, I liked, uh, I think it was very true what you said that, and this is true not only for Asia, worldwide. And here I'm happy to do our partner, traditional partner, UNHCR's work for them, but we need more official refugee resettlement countries, and we need larger, more respectable quotas. We, we move maximum 1% a year of all refugees. That's a poor show for us all, but anyway, thank you for calling that to our attention and for the list you gave us of practical recommendations and the three essentials for the uh, Global Compact on Migration. So thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Um, distinguished participants, you've been very patient uh, as we've listened to uh, four, I think, extremely uh, enriching uh, presentations, each one uh, a somewhat of a different angle. So I think you've got now an opportunity to use the last half hour of our morning session to pose questions, make comments, uh, raise objections. <laughs> um, uh, whatever you'd like to do, but uh, let's try to have a more interactive discussion now. I know the panelists would be eager to hear from you in terms of how you react to what they've said or your own views on the compact. So the floor is open. Sorry? Sierra Leone. Ambassador, good to see you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm DG. Um, and thank you to our panel. I think we've had a very interesting um, sort of um, discussions from the panel they have, that has set the stage for our subsequent discussions. I just want to refer to one or two things. Um, let us say that when it comes to looking at migration as a global issue, we have come a long way. I still remember the ICPD in Cairo in 1994 where mention of migration within country was considered to be a bilateral issue and it was not, it was not um, encouraged that this be discussed in an international forum or that it be a global issue. So I think we have come a long way. The very fact that we are now talking about global compact for safe, orderly and regular mi migration from process to substance is reassuring. Um, the only the point I would like to raise here is how much of what we have, what has been put on the table, and what has been agreed upon in certain sectors would be incorporated into this global compact. And because Mary Robinson is on the panel, I would raise one question relating to human rights. As you know, there's the International Convention 
on the protection of the rights of all migrant workers and members of their families. And um, this is something which at the Human Rights Council we have been talking about. But it's really surprising and disappointing, and maybe she could throw some light on it, that there are only 49 state parties to that convention and 17 signatories to this day. And I was wondering, because when you look at the convention itself, it's, it's talking about some of the rights which we have had and which have been brought forward by this panel itself. So how do you see this in the light of this global compact? How do we improve um, 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 uh, um, accession to this particular um, human rights convention? The second point that I would, write, I would like to raise is that of um, climate change. And I think um, Mary Robinson you put it quite clearly that um, indeed climate change is going to is going to uh, create problems for some countries. And even if indeed in some from some quarters, even if we could reach the 1.5 degree, it would still raise problems for some countries. And when you think about it, many of these countries that are going to be worst affected are those that did the minimum to create the situation that we find in the world today. In that sense, I would say that what we should be looking at right now is contingency planning. What do we do to some of these small island countries that risk disappearing uh, as, as a result of climate change? Shouldn't we be looking at contingency plans whereby there could be accommodated solutions could be found for people? Because unless we do so, we do not want to wait for the situation to get to a point where, loss, where there are massive loss of life. So these are the two points that I would like to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. We have uh, uh, let's take two more f uh, speakers, uh, India followed by Japan. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the panelists for giving a detailed account of uh, how the global compact on migration should look like. The ideas which were expressed are really thought-provoking and uh, very practical in nature. Uh, as as we all know that the UN, UN Summit for Migration and Refugees held at New York decided to have two separate sets of global compacts, one on migration and one on refugees. The overall idea behind this segregation was to give adequate attention to both these important issues and deal them separately as they require separate sets of policies, rules and procedures. If, I mean, as DG has also mentioned, if we see the latest trends, more than 90% of the 247 million people living outside their country of birth are economic migrants and only 10% are refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, there has been a growing trend and negative or you can say toxic connotations uh, because the uh, refugees and asylum seekers are not welcomed in many parts of the world. Uh, given this background, uh, there is a need to uh, see that the global compact on migration should primarily remain focused on looking at the 90% of the aspect which is, pure, which is mainly the economic migration. We feel that uh, the compact of migration, apart from the suggestions which has been made by the panelists, should focus on the economic dimension and work towards eliminating fresh barriers to the economic migration, create an environment for safe, orderly, and regular migration, and open the legal channels of migration, and widen it, and further liberalize it. They are, uh, almost all the panelists have uh, made their suggestions on these lines. Uh, since r around 48% of the migrants are women, so uh, we need to have uh, our migration goal, global compact on migration more gender sensi sensitive and it provides equal opportunities to women and adopt a non-discriminatory policies and practices. Special provisions are also required to be kept in the uh, global compact to take care of the people in vulnerable situations and in include the peoples with disabilities. Uh, uh, one of the most important aspects of the Global Compact has been uh, ha has to be the protection of the human rights of the migrants and provide measurable and uh, measures to identify vulnerabilities and stop exploitation and ex excuse. Uh, 
there is of course uh, an urgent need to reduce the incidence and impacts of irregular migration including trafficking in persons and migrants smuggling as well as the facilitate their return and reintegration uh, at the same time we also like to uh, i mean uh, advocate that apart from the sdg ag agenda 10.7 there is also a need to look at 8.8 very cl uh, closely because uh, out of these migrants if 90% are working outside their country in the labor market their protection of their labor rights and promoting safe and secure working environment for all workers including migrant workers is extremely important and this will also ensure the protection to women migrants from precarious employment thank you very much thank you very much i want to give the floor now to uh, president mary robinson to respond Thank you very much. I wanted to respond to the two uh, questions from the ambassador of, of Sierra Leone because I think they're, uh, they're, they're important issues in this um, context. Um, I agree that it's important to look at the International Convention on the Protection of All Migrant Workers and Their Families in the context of a global compact on migration. Um, it's true that um, no major receiving country has uh, um, uh, agreed to adopt that convention, which is a pity um, because it, 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 it's, it's very one-sided in its approach, but there are important rights that are recognized and addressed in that convention, and I think it would be good if some of them could be incorporated into the Global Compact, um, and I, 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 think, I think that would be um, uh, definitely be a step forward. Um, I agree very much, um, Ambassador, with uh, the point that you made about those most vulnerable to having to move because of climate change um, are um, likely to be and are indeed the least responsible. That's why I, I have framed it as an issue of justice. And I think we have to bear that in mind that um, it will be an increasing driver. And it won't just be uh, the need to consider uh, communities or small island states as indeed Ambassador Swing has um, referenced, I quoted him since he made this statement on the 19th of September, that there are about 75 million people living on coastlines one metre or less above sea level. I think that is a very good way of framing the extent of the uh, driver that climate change will increasingly be um, uh, as uh, sea level rises. And unfortunately, uh, we seem to be anticipating that that may happen more quickly than scientists <coughs> had initially predicted, uh, which is very worrying news indeed. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a, an uncomfortable reality among lots of other uncomfortable realities. So I think we do need contingency plans. Um, and that's part of what I hope uh, the Global Compact will be, will be looking at, how, how we can um, increase resilience. Obviously, I, I, as I said in my, in my, in my own um, uh, contribution, I, I do think it would be good if there can be a referencing across to the Paris Agreement and its um, uh, uh, um, n need to reduce the risk by uh, uh, taking the steps that are flagged in the Paris Agreement. And I, I, I'm glad to see that that was strongly reinforced in Marrakesh by all um, countries. And I, I think that that's, that that's an important part of the coherence um, that I was um, uh, seeking to emphasize in particular um, in, in, in that context. Um, but I, I just um, leave it to those two questions, um, uh, th those two responses to um, two very relevant questions. Thank you. And I'm, I'm afraid that I have to slip away now because I have to go and talk to the IASC of the UN about um, El Nino and climate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, see you soon. Okay, in the interest of time, let's move right along. I want to call now on the distinguished representative of Japan. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Swing, and I also say thank you all the panelists for sharing with us a very useful inputs. Um, although sir, she's leaving, but uh, in my view, the President Robinson identified some very important points, which you all have to take into consideration in our joint efforts to create a good and effective uh, global migration compact. 
Amongst them, I particularly echo the importance of people-centered approach. And in the same vein, uh, Professor Iguchi, not by coincidence, drew our attention to different local approaches to the migration issues. In this respect, uh, I underline the critical roles to be played by regional consultations, because different national and regional stakeholders are able to get their voices to be heard in such regional consultations. Recently, we had similar experiences about regional consultations that is a preparatory process for World Humanitarian Summit. These consultations for WHS were in fact effective in collecting uh, data, evidences, good and sometimes bad lessons learned from a large number of very various stakeholders, including civil societies. But at the same time, these processes were a bit inconclusive not quite good in establishing common principles. Maybe the subject dealt by World Humanitarian Summit were quite wide, but the migration is also just as wide. So my comment or request is that um, you know, the regional consultation and other fora to discuss the yes, global, uh, global compact so will be purpose-oriented, be conscious about the final result, and at the same time, time and resource, effi uh, resource efficient. Thank you. <coughs> the chairman, a few brief remarks and also thank you to the panelists. I'm very much looking forward to reading the full report from the SRSG when it comes out. I think a, a few things that were mentioned on the panel are, are very important to us, and implementation is surely one of them. We have, and if you mentioned the Bern Initiative, maybe you want to also look into the Global Commission on International Migration that issued a report almost 10 years ago, It's well, actually 10 years ago, where there are some, some things that you still can build on, on an implementation. I think that it, we need to be practical. We need more coordination. We need more governance in order to facilitate the implementation that is needed. And I agree with what someone said about the need to address responsibility sharing. Th this is a common responsibility, and we need to share it more evenly among states. On the process, I can echo very much what, what the Japanese uh, delegate just said. We need an inclusive process. with. Uh, Consultations, I think regional consultations is a good idea. We need to make sure that states and other relevant stakeholders, uh, the, the civil society and the private sector are being listened to. And I also would again like to highlight the important role that we think IOM can play in, in the this process, uh, building on your expertise and also the expertise of other U UN organizations now that you, you are a UN organization. We need to build on that and, and also what is, is being done in this city and, and not forget about this is all the expertise that you can draw up on in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have three more speakers in the interest of uh, hearing as many as possible. <coughs> we do this and then I'll ask each of our speakers uh, to make a uh, wrap-up comment trying to address some of the questions. I have Save the Children, uh, Australia and the European Public Law uh, organization, and one has more has just been added, Thailand. Okay, um, save the children. You have the floor. Um, I would like to echo some of the of the remarks that were made uh, during the panel and um, by uh, some member states, um, particularly the the importance of the involvement of civil society and particularly migrants themselves, uh, including migrant children, in the design, drafting and consultations for the compact, together with governments throughout the process. Um, uh, this is crucial to harness the expertise and experience of, of those directly affected and on the front line to find rights-based solutions to a multifaceted and complex phenomenon. And uh, we would be very happy to hear some also practical suggestions uh, from the panelists on how to do this. Um, another key consideration is how the compact will respond to the needs and ensures protection of migrants in vulnerable situations, particularly migrant children. 
Indeed, children make up a sizable percentage of those caught in large migration flows, with nearly 50 million children moving across borders or forcibly displaced. And from the time they leave their country of origin and all the way through to the destination countries, children on the move have specific protection needs and face great risks of abuse, violence and exploitation along the route and in destination countries. Often they are not afforded the same protection and support as other children and face discrimination and suspicion. So we would like to uh, draw also specific attention to uh, ensuring that every migrant children has access to protection and education as soon as possible and that the compact should ensure education as an essential and vital component of the services and durable solutions to which migrant children are entitled. And finally, we would like to emphasize the importance of the compact as an actionable document that will actually help uh, to operationalize uh, the rights of children, but human rights of migrants more generally, and the best interest of the child as a primary considerations of all actions in the context of migration, ensuring that children are considered and treated as children first and foremost, with all the rights, protection and services they are entitled under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Australia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, look, we welcome what was a very rich discussion and uh, got a lot out of each presentation by the panellists, so thank you very much for facilitating this. I thought the goals um, expressed by you, Director General Swing, Swing, namely to facilitate the migration we want, to reduce or eliminate irregular migration and its pernicious effects, and to better respond to crises were particularly well stated. And from Australia's point of view, we think it's also very important to ensure regional perspectives are incorporated into the consultations for the Global Compact. And in this light, we particularly appreciated having an Asia-Pacific perspective on today's panel with the presentation by Professor Iguchi. So thank you very much. Um, the, the Migration Compact, which will be state-led and inclusive, obviously built on the foundation, as you yourself noted, Director General, of state sovereignty needs to strengthen global cooperation in areas that we need it the most. So I guess my question is, how do we achieve a practical, realistic compact that isn't overburdened with expectations, has a sense of priority, and also a workable, actionable agenda to strengthen the cooperation that we need? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, European Public Law Organization. Thank you, Director General. I have a question for Professor Iguchi. Uh, his presentation were rather fast, went rather fast, and um, if I recall well, he mentioned, of course, the mixed flows, and he singled out three countries for receiving low numbers of um, migrants, and that was South Korea, China, and Japan. Uh, he then went on to uh, mention some practical measures to be taken. Uh, again, this went fast, but uh, he mentioned legal avenues, also labor market uh, measures. So what is the link? Uh, in other words, how can you link the low number of migration uh, received to uh, your reforms? What kind of migration will happen in the end. Uh, I'm not very clear on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is the representative of Thailand. Thank you. Um, I agree with the panelists on the link between migration and that positive contribution and sustainable development. The core issue lies in the way that states have been struggling and managing um, migration issue with their local and unilateral approaches, which has failed us in bringing out its maximum benefits. This global phenomenon um, certainly needs international cooperation for more effective and coherent um, management. This will enhance all national efforts and bring us closer to achieving the related sustainable development goals. Um, and I would like to add some additional points on the um, Global Compact. 
To translate the Global Compact into action, it should contain a balanced approach for countries of origin, transit, and destination to allow all countries to benefit from migration's positive contribution and development. It should also take into account that the principle of international burden sharing and addressing the root causes while outlining measures for states to curb the negative effects of migration in a more responsible manner. Thailand will actively take part in the discussions and hope that the Global Compact will provide clear policy, policy objectives and inspire legislative rigor in improving related laws and measures to identify and pay particular attention to vulnerable groups, including women, children, the elderly, and persons with disabilities to enhance access to basic health care and education, to eliminate xenophobia and discrimination, and to create a more harmonious society. Thailand hopes that it will set a framework to promote cooperation in labor market governance, to reduce migration costs, and to protect migrants in all situations. It should also aim to strengthen international law enforcement to tackle human trafficking and people smuggling in a more coordinated approach. The terms of process, Thailand's support, um, inclusive participation in the discussion on the Global Compact, IOM's upgraded relationship between IOM and the UN is timely to take part in facilitating the negotiations. Thailand also supports regional initiatives such as the Bali process to participate in drafting the Compact so that they reflect the regional chair policy direction and expand the regional collective efforts at a larger scale. Meanwhile, we are, currently, we are currently working with the IOM to complete the regional information campaign to build awareness for safe migration in the Indian Ocean region. At home in Thailand, we have continued our efforts re um, recently issuing the Royal Ordinance on bringing migrants workers in work to work with employers to improve management of recruitment agencies and prevent migrant workers from being exploited. All migrants and their dependents in the country have access to health insurance scheme and basic education. Finally, apart from governments and international organizations, Thailand encourages the business community and migrants themselves to take part in suggesting innovative and implementable ideas to improve the lives of migrants. At the same time, civil society can help foster a more conducive environment and strengthen the collective efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our list of speakers. Uh, we're slowly running out of time. So I want to ask each of our speakers if they would like to uh, make a final statement in, if possible, addressing some of the questions uh, and good statements that have been made. Uh, let's start with Professor Iguchi because several questions were directly uh, posed to you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. <clears throat> um, I'm I'm very afraid, but uh, uh, we I I could not uh, uh, take too, uh, enough time to discuss how to uh, how to realize uh, legal migration and which which is uh, which contain decent work and also labor protection and also care for the children and women and uh, at the same time uh, whether Asian countries can uh, have accept more migrants from outside, and that is naturally a very important question. But uh, from our research uh, results, we think there are growing labor market mismatches not only in highly skilled and low skilled, but in so-called middle, middle skill, uh, there has been very small channels from outside from uh, for for migrants. That is, but also uh, in, those were pointed out by the Migration Institute in the United States, and uh, middle skill jobs uh, requires uh, a certain 
uh, high school education, plus uh, two or three years schooling, and, and then to some kind of official certificate and so. And this kind of uh, um, uh, human resource investment has been uh, an obstacle for, for, for these uh, um, uh, areas to, to be, become become uh, uh, to to uh, to, ac to to accept uh, uh, migrant workers but in the also in the case of Germany a so called uh, um, slogan uh, integration through qualification integration through qualification is very much uh, very, very 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 adequate Especially in the in the in in the uh, layer of uh, middle school jobs, and there are uh, also great uh, discrepancies of demand and supply, and also mismatches of nat uh, of native workers. That is also one reason that we should uh, strengthen training, education, and training, so that they can have get a certificate and also qualification and stable jobs and decent work. That is naturally one very important channel. And at the same time, because of the time constraint, I'd like to tell you about uh, one thing, just one thing, sorry. <laughs> when we talk about the Asian Pacific, we do not uh, overlook the distinction of formal employment and informal sectors employment. Informal sector employment, it has become a pool of low skilled labor uh, with, uh, uh, with, with that protection. And uh, this has also become a, a great background that migration of, of so-called uh, housemates or uh, also construction workers get lower remuneration and less protections. It is also important for them to be qualified and get, and, uh, get higher uh, and stable working conditions, but in the, in, in the long run, uh, to become a developed country for the middle-income countries, it is naturally important to reduce and shrink, uh, make informal sector shrink so that this kind of stable employment be reduced. But naturally, for the moment, it is naturally very important to, to give more, more youngsters, give uh, more opportunity for youngsters to get out, of, get out of the informal sector employment. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Radio. Muchas gracias. DG, eh, bueno, muy brevemente, creo que una de las, o la principal pregunta que, que flota aquí, eh, por lo que se ha dicho en, la, en el panel y también en las interesantes y constructivas participaciones desde el piso, es cómo nos aseguramos, cómo logramos que todos esos elementos, eh, expectativas que creo que en general compartimos, cómo se reflejarán en el, en el pacto. Y bueno, probablemente en este estado del proceso, en este... Eh, eh, estadio del proceso, quizá la respuesta sea todavía un poco humilde en el sentido de que tenemos que construirlo juntos, eh, juntos los estados, los organismos internacionales, la sociedad civil, incluyendo desde luego los migrantes, los académicos, y eh, un paso muy importante pues serán las modalidades, desde luego, que están en construcción y que, como decíamos, se presentarán en breve. Eh, creo que así, un primer buen paso ha sido las consultas tanto en Ginebra como en Nueva York, donde los cofacilitadores estuvieron muy abiertos a escuchar la retroalimentación de todos estos sectores y intentarán, desde luego, con la mejor voluntad, plantearlo en las, en las modalidades. Eh, creo que ese, esa, digamos, es, es un proceso que tenemos que construir juntos. Esto me lleva muy brevemente, eh, embajador, simplemente a mencionar que nos toca en Ginebra. Yo creo que también es muy claro de las presentaciones que eh, el valor agregado que puede dar Ginebra es, es enorme. Y simplemente una obviedad en qué lugar que no sea Ginebra, 
podemos ver eh, el fenómeno de la migración y tenemos experiencia, conocimientos, eh, eh, inclusive en el terreno, desde los ámbitos laboral, derechos humanos, eh, no se diga migración, salud, es un lugar privilegiado en ese sentido, Ginebra. Por eso es que eh, seguramente tendremos que encontrar la manera en que esta, es, esta expertise, esta experiencia de Ginebra se refleje a lo largo del proceso de negociación. Y desde luego hay muchas formas, una de ellas es la que se ha mencionado aquí, las herramientas con que ya contamos como las eh, eh, consultas regionales, donde las particularidades de cada región, valga la redundancia, tendrán que ser reflejadas eh, eh, en, en ese proceso. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'll give the final word to our special advisor, Mr. Maniatis, with the permission of the interpreters, and you will take two, three more minutes <coughs> beyond the hour. Thank you. Two minutes. That's all. I don't want to be standing between a large crowd and lunch. So the representative of India uh, brought up the issue of refugees and migrants to compacts. Uh, it's worth remembering how this started. It was uh, a, a, a summit meeting in New York on the large scale of movement of uh, large scale of movements of migrants and refugees. We need to go back to that. It was a combined uh, plan of action that should have come out of New York, and we've come out of New York with two separate processes. I think they need to be recombined. You are invoking uh, the expertise in Geneva. It should be combined here. My close colleague and Peter's also senior advisor of many years, 11 years, Francois Fouinat, points out, for instance, the need to come up with protocols and infrastructure to be able to determine status closer to conflicts, closer to the point of uh, initial movement. There are many other ways in which the two agendas combine, and I think it's critical to do that from now and not to go down two separate paths. Uh, the second point I would make, and the last point really is, that the compact should not just be uh, an accumulation of everyone's important cause, as important as those causes might be. We have documents that do that. The New York Declaration does that. There should be practical and political goals in the process of the next two years. I'll give you one political goal, is to create a framework, a balance of interests, an equilibrium amongst the various stakeholders that holds. So what is it that needs to get done that keeps everyone who needs to be at the table at the table. If we're talking about international cooperation, we have to strike that equilibrium, that balance of interests with this process. So that's a political goal. I think that's very clear and very difficult. But there's also a practical goal, which is we need to be proving, as I said earlier, that we can actually get things done. And so from now, countries, stakeholders should be able to identify ideas. We've been discussing what we need to do for well over a decade grab onto one of those ideas and take them forward so that we know much more about them by 2018 than we do now and that we've tested even perhaps through pilot schemes how to do these things. Thank you.